Welcome to our uh, sixth installment, and very appropriately, the weather decided to cooperate with today's theme. We're going to talk about water. So, um, to me, I think uh, water is one of the most important uh, substances. I think uh, it's one of the things that so far we can agree upon. Essentially, all life as we know it means water. And so, one of the questions that I want to talk about and get into is uh, when do we know? Or how do we know that the early Earth had water on it? And do we know if that water was liquid, if it was uh, gas? Uh, basically, do we know how far back does the evidence for, say, an ocean on Earth, on the surface of Earth, go? Uh, or lakes, or things like that. So how far back can we go with evidence for liquid water? So just for those of you who may have uh, missed some lectures, just very quickly, we're, this is the sort of the traditional view of the early Earth, that it was hot, dry, hellish. I don't need to tell you that when there's molten rock on the surface of Earth, liquid water is not going to be stable. It's going to be way too hot for that. So we're going to, uh, uh, we've evaluated this view uh, quite a bit. This came about before we even knew that there were samples that were as old as uh, this time period of the Hadean, that's older than four billion years. And the mineral that we're primarily going to focus on uh, that I've shown you, this is the, this is the Zircon's great slide from last lecture, but just to refresh everyone's memory, since you don't spend your entire week thinking about this lovely mineral, uh, this is a zirconium silicate uh, mineral. It's one of the toughest minerals that we know of. It forms in all sorts of crustal rocks, particularly in granitic rocks. It has uh, a whole suite of elements that go into it, and more importantly, a whole bunch that don't. So here's the periodic table. Uh, the white elements are ones that don't go into zircon in any appreciable quantity. Uh, the ones, the color coding here, the orange ones really like to go in. So zircon is great, it takes a lot of uranium, doesn't take any lead, so the uranium lead system lets us accurately date the zircons back to, uh, you know, up to 4.4 billion years old in the terrestrial setting. Uh, thorium can also be used to date them and also decay the lead. We've talked about hafnium isotopes, I'll refresh our uh, thinking on that today. And titanium, we talked about, has been calibrated to give us the temperature at which the zircons crystallize. Uh, then today, most of it, the evidence for the water is going to come from oxygen. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the oxygen and the isotopes of oxygen. For those who are not so uh, familiar, uh, isotopes of the same element are, I think, are it's the same element, but it has a different number of neutrons. So it's got the same number of protons, but just a different mass. Uh, and so that's going to lead to some slight chemical changes in that we can, uh, we can measure the ratio of 18 oxygen to 16 oxygen really precisely in a lab. And those are going to behave slightly differently in chemical reactions or evaporation. And that's how we're going to see about the evidence for liquid water. Uh, the rare earth elements down here also go in in varying abundance. We're going to look at cerium a little bit. It's going to tell us about uh, the redox state. Uh, by that I just mean basically how much oxygen is available for chemical reactions. Uh, so you're all familiar with iron rusting. When there's a lot of oxygen around, iron wants to rust. It wants to go into FeO or Fe2O3. When there's very little oxygen around, iron, the metal, is much more stable. So that's how I want you to think. Oxidizing, rust, reducing metallic iron. Do we actually find plutonium? Uh, there's evidence, there's a lot of evidence for plutonium in the early solar system. There's two, there, the primary way that this is done is that both plutonium and uranium will fission spontaneously in nature, 238 fissions and then the plutonium fissions, and they actually make xenon. So part of the fission yields here are xenon, and then there are excesses over what you can explain in any other way, and that's what you need uh, plutonium uh, for. So people have actually done this in the zircons as well. They've taken the little zircons and looked at what the xenon looks like. Isotopically, you can find evidence for extinct plutonium in the early solar system. Uh, the heaviest one we've found evidence for so far naturally is purium-247. So we can actually go heavier than plutonium which is, you know, around 244, 242. Uh, I was so, aware that plutonium even appears naturally, if I was a part of my nuclear. Uh, it does, so all of these things here, these are the R process, uh, these are pure R process elements, anything past lead. So they are made, uh, if you paid attention to the LIGO announcement, where they found two neutron stars that were merging, that's what we think the process is that makes these uh, elements. And so it's responsible for our complement of 
uranium and make some plutonium as well. Uh, not a supernova, most likely. The supernova models have, uh, pro have problems with uh, making these elements, but the neutron star models make, uh, have a much easier time doing it. And now that we've seen them, it seems like a pretty reasonable uh, idea. So uh, we spent a lot of time last week discussing a lot of the geochemistry of the nonhydrium zircons, just as the reminder before we uh, sort of continue on. These are the jack hills in Western Australia. Uh, this is about eight hours by car in the north of Perth, and it's uh, quite far from any real city. Uh, not a lot of people want to live out here. These are what the zircons look like, uh, really zoomed in. Uh, these are a big one of these is maybe a third. This is maybe a third of a millimeter or something. So these are really tiny. There you can see the rock with a ten for scale. Uh, we talked about the titanium content being indicative of uh, the temperature at which they crystallize, and we see when we analyze these in the zircons that we get a peak at about 680 degrees C. This is about as cold as you can make a magma. So there's a lot of water in this, tens of weight percent probably. So that this is uh, something that's already telling us that the magma in which these zircons formed, that there was a lot of water around, so the planet can't have been completely dry. Uh, the inclusions uh, look quartz, muscovite, feldspar inside the zircons. These look very much like granites, like the continental crust when you go and pick out on it. It doesn't look at all like a basalt, which would be olivine and pyroxene, so that already tells us uh, that these are quite evolved. And we're going to uh, make use of this analogy a little further. Uh, the heat flows are much lower, so since we know we can estimate the depth at which they crystallize and the fact that we have muscovite, and from the temperature from where they crystallize, so we can get some idea of how much heat is flowing to the surface. Uh, this is really low. Uh, we've talked about hafnium isotopes, and the hafnium isotopes <coughs> these, uh, behave differently because lutetium decays to hafnium, and this is suggesting that there was an event early on, lutetium and hafnium separate from each other when you form a crust. So when you take your, mant your earth, the silicate portion outside of the core, and you melt it to form basically your mantle and your crust, they separate, uh, then this is what the crustal rocks will have a lower lutetium hafnium, and this is suggesting that whatever event that formed the crust happened really early. Uh, they look like they formed, they did not form in something like oceanic uh, crust. They really look like they formed inside the continental field, which is sort of uh, where they fall here, as they look like continental crust. Uh, and the, the easiest explanation is something like a subduction zone, so that as you bring sediments down, these sediments can have a lot of water in them, then they melt, and then you have a magma with a lot of uh, water in it, and so then you can form the Hadean zircons, and the question for today is, was there liquid water here, or was it, you know, uh, more dry at the surface, or maybe really hot if you had something like a, a steam atmosphere, and we'll even get at the end a little bit, if there's time, into uh, what the atmosphere might have looked like in terms of its composition. So, uh, water is not the easiest substance to deal with geologically, it likes to move around, uh, it can't be dated. Uh, well at all. It's incredibly reactive chemically. It's hard to study because you need to preserve it, so we can basically only study water by looking at its effect on the rock record. So we're looking for something, we're looking for an indirect signature that water was there, rather than saying, hey look, this is 4.4 billion year old water that I have in my hand. We are not at the place where we can do that. Uh, the oldest uh, water, if you're curious, was actually found in a mine. This is the Pimmons mine, I believe in Canada. And they, here are their ability to estimate this. They're trying to say, look, we have a little bit of uh, helium-4, 21 neon, some xenon and argon that are being produced. And these age estimates have error bars you know, on the order of a billion years. So they're basically saying, look, it's a billion and a half years old, plus or minus a billion years. That's not really a useful way uh, to date something. And uh, this came out as, is, the oldest, uh, is the oldest water that they have on the, the rest of this act, as you don't uh, really need to look at it, so they will. Um, so that's as far back as the direct evidence goes. So we're going to have to look at the isotope record, and in particular, we're going to have to look at oxygen uh, for this. So here, uh, the issue here is that 
you would you would naively expect from a sort of a first order view, right? If you have the same number of protons and electrons that independent of your mass, that you would react chemically pretty similarly. And this is true. So the chemical behavior by and large is set by how many protons and how many electrons you have. But there are very small differences in the uh, strength of the bonds that depend upon the mass. So if you are a really heavy isotope, you're likely to be just a little bit more stable in your chemical bond than a light isotope. And this is a really, really tiny difference uh, that has that is almost imperceptible chemically, but it leads to a small, on the order of part per thousand, part per ten thousand effects in the isotopic signature. So the way that this is usually represented is here is, uh, imagine I have two atoms that are bonded together. Uh, this, you know, at zero is my one atom, and the position of the uh, other one is usually, so if it gets, if they get too close, if they're uncomfortable, they want to repel each other. If they're too far apart, they go, well, I still kind of like you, so they find this sort of happy medium to exist that. And the point is here, for example, that we have a hydrogen bond to a hydrogen. It is slightly less stable. It has slightly higher energy. The lower you are here, the more stable you are than a hydrogen-deuterium bond. And a deuterium, deuterium, yeah? Since the bond takes the bond, the electrons, and the electron shell, that's what gives it chemical activity, what does the uh, isotope have to do with the strength uh, of the, uh, the, the It ultimately determines, we'll get there in a second, it ultimately determines the vibrational frequency. And so the, vibrate, the, the faster you vibrate, the less stable you are. And so the heavier you are, the heavier mass, it's much harder to vibrate, and then you are slightly more stable. So it's a mass effect. Yes, it's entirely a mass effect, and so this is appropriately all named mass-dependent fractionation, because it just depends upon the mass. Uh, difference. So here, so deuterium, it's a little bit more stable because the vibrational frequency is a little bit lower. Um, so in, uh, in one sense, the other way that you can sort of understand it is that uh, if you just even look at the molecules themselves, uh, you can, they will have the same kinetic energy, they're at the same temperature, so they have the same energy, and so you can simply ask, well, how much faster does the light one move? And you basically get that it's the difference between uh, the square root of the masses of the two molecules. So for water, a 16O, uh, so water bonded to, so two hydrogens bonded to a 16O will move just a little bit faster uh, than water bonded to, uh, so two hydrogens bonded to an 18 oxygen. So that, so if you have, for example, evaporation, the light isotope will evaporate uh, preferentially. If you have you know, chemical stability, the heavier bond will just be a little bit more stable. It's entirely a mass effect. This has been put to really good use as a small aside for, uh, for recent times in that you can actually see this effect happen. So the, uh, the ocean, say it has, this is uh, the little delta value, of, we've defined this before, but this is the part per thousand difference between the measured sample and your standard. In this case, the ocean is zero because the ocean is our standard. People use ocean water uh, to standardize. So this, basically, when this is at minus 13, it is saying that this has uh, 13 parts per thousand less 18 oxygen in it than ocean water. So it is slightly lighter in mass. Uh, the rainfall, so the lighter isotope prefers to evaporate. The, the heavier isotope actually rains out first. And so you can actually see that there is a massive fractionation due to precipitation. Uh, and this is uh, used. Uh, to show you how sort of wide-ranging this is, this is used to reconstruct our uh, temperature record from ice cores for studying things like global warming. Uh, so you can dig out ice cores kilometers deep. They show annual layers. Here's a picture of one. Each arrow indicates basically one year's worth of ice in the ice core because there's a little bit of melting and uh, re-precipitation of the ice. So the ice layer melts and freezes during uh, the temperature of the year so they can uh, count this out. <coughs> Then you can go and make a calibration curve. You can look at the oxygen isotopes again. This is the part per thousand deviation from uh, the standard, so from ocean water. So this is all a little bit uh, lighter than the ocean water. It's all negative. And then you can plot it versus present day temperature. And you can do this in a whole bunch of different places and get you know, a nice linear regression that you can use to calculate, if I measure this in my ice, what's my temperature going to be? Uh, 
And that's how we end up with these records that you might have seen before, where you can then plot temperature back hundreds of thousands or even uh, millions of years in the record just from looking at the oxygen isotopes and correlating them with temperature. So that's a little different than what I want to do with it today, but that's just to show you sort of what the, uh, the possible range of effects is. And temperature actually has a huge effect on this because at low, uh, the little differences in energy are much more significant at low temperatures than they are at high temperatures. So when it's really hot, uh, these isotope effects tend to go away. At low temperatures, they can be really important. Luckily, you know, zero degrees C is pretty cold for this. So, to, uh, to go, so why does this matter? This is the vibrational stability. This is sort of the answer that I gave to your question, is that uh, basically uh, the heavier you are, the less likely you are, uh, the slower you will vibrate, and so you're a little bit more stable. The frequency depends upon the mass of the atoms. And this is how molecules store thermal energy when you're at room temperature is basically in vibrations. So the molecules, all of them are vibrating just a little bit, and that's how, that's how they store their thermal energy. So they will vibrate a little bit more, uh, and a, a little bit more energetically, a little higher frequency when they're lighter, and so this makes them a whole lot uh, less stable for our, our perspective. So, heavy isotope forms a lower energy bond, it doesn't vibrate as violently, and there's really a nice rule that the heavy isotope goes preferentially into the compound with the strongest bonds. So, the effect that we're going to look at here is what happens when water interacts with rocks at low temperature. So, what happens basically as you form a clay? So, as you take your rock, you weather it, you form a clay, you're, basically, you're saying that the oxygen is going to uh, go slightly differently between the clay and the water. Um, just a, a quick notational note. People uh, really like this expression. You're going to see it on the next page. You're going to see, you know, basically a thousand times the log of uh, some value in alpha. This is basically the difference in parts per thousand between your two things. So basically, this would be clay minus water. So this is just, so basically, when I, what I'm going to show you is in some way going to relate very easily to the effect we're trying to measure to the sort of part per thousand level, just as a note. And these are incredibly temperature sensitive, so this is usually modeled versus 1 over t squared. So this is not just linear in temperature, it's actually much faster than that. So you get a huge uh, sensitivity, so warm temperatures, this is going to become a tiny number and you're just going to approach constant. At low temperatures, this makes a really good thermometer. There's a huge temperature uh, sensitivity uh, here. So uh, we can go around and uh, look at the entire um, rock record. Uh, we can find variations of oxygen, uh, oxygen isotopes, so mid-ocean ridge basalts that form, uh, the mantle is melting and forming crust. Uh, other basalts, and so, and then here is the sedimentary rock record at the delta 18O. It is really uh, heavy, like plus 20, so 2% enriched in 18O over uh, the mantle or other uh, uh, sources called uh, seawater, call it zero. So, the reason that this happens is because as the water and the rocks are interacting with each other, the light isotope would prefer to stay in the water, and the heavy uh, isotope would prefer to go into the clay that is forming. And so then you're continuously making your, your clays, your sedimentary rocks, you're making them heavy isotopically, and what's going to happen if you melt this material is you're going to uh, influence the oxygen isotope composition of the magma, because a lot of the, basically, because some of the oxygen is coming from here and has these high values. So, uh, Again, when you're going through this, just a quick sort of uh, definition. Here's the, the other way to put this without the time. So this is basically telling you that the ratio between them, and then uh, this would be nine parts per uh, thousand. So these are really small effects and why we use them. Well, this is between liquid and vapor at 25 degrees C. So here is the experimental uh, work that's been done. And the line that I want to particularly focus on, so this is a kind of a weird plot. This is the 1,000 ln alpha, so this is basically the sort of part per thousand difference that people measure. So, you know, here's zero, 10 parts per thousand, so a percent, uh, 2 percent, 2.8 percent. This is temperature, so, you know, 700 degrees down to 25. And you can see at high temperatures, just like I told you, these tiny energy differences become almost irrelevant. 
and you're going to end up very similar to zero. Uh, and then at much lower temperatures, you know, 50 degrees and below, where you've got liquid water is stable, right? If you're below 100 C, so you can have, you can have this, these other ones here above 100 C are done at pressure to stabilize it. Here's kaolinite, that's going to be our clay example. And you can see that you would, uh, from the theory, at you know, 25 degrees, you would say that it is 2.5%, or sorry, 2% heavier than the coexisting water. So you can, you, if you go and find a zircon that has a really high oxygen isotope composition, something really heavy, then there has been liquid water that interacted with rocks. That material made its way into the source region, melted in the magma, and uh, gave you that signature. So, uh, first off, I'd like to show just a little bit of an example that we can actually go out and find these processes taking place today. Uh, again, we're going to Australia here, and so these, this is uh, Sydney up here, there's the map, uh, there's Canberra, and so here are some rocks, some of which have had this sedimentary material in them when they melted and formed, and some that didn't, that basically formed from fresh mantle material. So you can zoom in on the map, and the two different rocks are itites for igneous, so these are things that form basically straight from the mantle, so the mantle melted and was processed to form the granites, versus the appropriately named S-type granites, where S-types are, S means sedimentary, so these are granites that have had a well-recognized sedimentary input, and this is work back in the late 70s, what I want you to look at is, here's the oxygen isotopes, here are our, our, our I-types, you know, 8 to 9, uh, and our S-type that had the sedimentary input where water and rock interacted is coming in at 10. So this is the type of differences that we're looking for because this, again, is incorporating oxygen from a sedimentary rock where there was water-rock interactions at these low temperatures, and this is what gave us the signature, and then this signature gets preserved through the melting process preserved through uh, forming the rock, and then, give, and then we can pick it up and do the analysis and find this evidence later. So that's the most direct way that we can get it, whether or not there was liquid water on the early Earth. Until somebody comes up and says, hey, look, I found it. Uh, so we have to use uh, these sort of very uh, indirect arguments because the record isn't quite what we'd like it to be. We've got zircons, and you know, no one's coming up to us with well-preserved fluids from that. Zircon survives melting. The zircons formed in the melting. So the zircons, so in this case here, the zircon would form with the granite from the source material and then basically inherit the signature. So the zircons so basically, these here are much younger samples where I'm showing this, but uh, the zircon plot here is uh, basically, these are the zircons that formed at older than 4 billion years. So again, here's the part per thousand deviation. The lunar samples here are just to show you what happens on a body that is dry. The moon is effectively bone dry, and you can see that there is no crack. This is just one distribution, and this is right around the mantle value, which is just a little bit above 5 per mil. This is, again, relative probability, so the higher the curve, the more likely, the more of the data that is there. Uh, people have done these studies uh, for a while. Different groups have done it. So the lunar curve is what we would expect if there weren't any water. This is what a dry Earth would look like uh, because the moon is, uh, is dry for this purpose. And then people went out and measured, and you can see that the green, red, and black curve here are all shifted to higher values. So you can find values where the oxygen isotopes and the zircons are heavy in comparison to uh, what you would expect from just the mantle, just from rocks forming in a dry environment. doesn't mean that they all are. Some of them clearly give uh, this value, but some of them indeed give, up, give us the, the high uh, oxygen uh, signature that shows, and that this offset here, say between this value and here, this is the evidence that there was liquid water on the early Earth, because that's what we would, that's what we would ex expect to happen. And this is basically the only way to form it. And on the case where we have a planet without water, we don't really see, or the moon, I guess, uh, we don't see this effect. We don't see this shift to, to heavier values. So these zircons go back. Uh, uh, almost to 4.4 billion years, and it suggests that the Earth has had a hydrosphere of some kind uh, between, uh, from basically 4.4 billion years to present day. 
that, so that there's been liquid water on the surface of Earth, and that this therefore makes the early Earth a lot more habitable than some of the pictures I showed you early on since. Um, throwing this in, into sort of a strange form, has anyone done any analysis on the oldest deep ocean methane hydrates? Uh, they're not, so the oceanic crust is in general not that old, so most of that is pretty recent. The oceanic crust with it is basically up until maybe 300 million years old, so it's, you know, less than 10% of the age of the planet. So it, because it's getting continuously produced and brought down its production zone, so it's getting continuously produced and destroyed. Uh, now, there, there is one thing I'd like, I'd just like to point out, is you might argue, you might ask me, well, since we have this offset, and earlier uh, I argued that you could use this as a thermometer, why don't I probably present uh, the surface temperatures of the Earth to you uh, from this time period? And the issue with that is we don't know what fraction of the material actually is the sedimentary, that part that came down and melted, and how much is fresh mantle material. So basically, the, you know, the sedimentary component could be anywhere to the right of here, and we don't quite know where, and then the mantle component is here, and we don't know, we don't know how much sediment went into the magma at any point in time, and we don't have any way of figuring that out. So there's, so this would only provide an upper limit on the temperatures, and if you were to do this, you, you'd find something like 100 C or something. You're in that ballpark. So you, you suggest it was pretty hot, but actually, I would argue that's essentially an upper limit, and you've got to take the temperatures below that because there's a way to make them closer, and smaller isotope effects are associated with higher temperatures. So you'd be running erroneously hot. So that's why you don't really see a proud plot of, look, we can tell you how warm it was outside 4.4 billion years ago. Uh, I'd love to do that, but we don't actually have a way of doing that at present. So the uh, to, to basically sort of put this back in with the uh, geodynamical regime with the sort of the plate tectonics like view where there's material getting brought down, melting and coming up. What this is saying is that here at the surface rocks were getting weathered in the presence of liquid water and that the evidence for this is the sedimentary material that gets produced, the clays and such that are getting dragged down by the subduction zone in this, in this process and that this actually makes it really easy to get a lot of water down there because it means that uh, this is how you can form really water-rich sedimentary rocks that can then get dragged down to depth and release all of their water. So it fits in really nicely with the evidence that I showed you previously from the titanium temperatures and the inclusion assemblage that you get, you know, muscovite and such, that this all sort of uh, fits together uh, with the oxygen isotopes uh, saying that there was liquid water that was weathering rock, right? If you, had, if you didn't have any and you just had this weathering take place in a, in a dry environment, it would be hard to envision how you get, you, you have dry rock and you subduct it and suddenly it gets wet. That's a little hard to explain. So it makes a lot more sense in the context of there was water here that was interacting with the rocks and that this is ultimately the water that's going to get supplied at depth uh, to the magma. And so this is also why the oceanic, right? This is the oceanic crust and this going down. So this is why there isn't really any old oceanic crust on the Earth. Except it's getting continuously destroyed in subduction zones. Um, so having, having covered and uh, shown you why we think that there was liquid water, I wanted to sort of spend a, a little bit of time on the, uh, on the, what we know or what we think we know about the atmospheric composition. This runs into a similar problem. We don't have any atmosphere from this time period. So again, we're going to have to look at uh, the not necessarily the effect of the atmosphere on the rock record, but the other way around. What does the rock record do to the atmosphere? And uh, so this is, uh, this is something that is a little bit difficult to study. And this is something that where uh, I want you to sort of understand this in terms of iron and rust. So this is a really funny unit, log FO2. This is the log of the partial pressure of oxygen and is a, is a really weird unit that I don't expect, uh, I don't actually like, or, but it's something that the geochemists absolutely love. So the way that I want you to understand this is, here is temperature in Celsius, here's uh, one over temperature, and here is iron and iron oxide. And basically, this is called iron, the iron-wustite buffer. And what's happening is at 
below this line, so when you have a low log FO2, iron wants to be stable, and when you go above this line, iron oxide wants to be stable. So the zone of terrestrial magmas are all up here. We don't tend to find a lot of iron in its reduced form. We find a lot of rust. So there's other ones. Uh, here you can imagine, here's the behavior of nickel. Uh, and at this point here, uh, below it, nickel wants to be stable as a metal. And above it, nickel wants to be stable as an oxide. So again, so the higher the FO2, the more oxidizing the conditions are, and the uh, more likely you are to find the iron in the presence of, of as rust, and the less likely you are to find it in, the, in iron. So the question is, what was the early Earth like on this diagram? Can we place it? Presently, it's here. So we want to find uh, iron as iron oxide. Uh, and the question is, has it always been like this? Because when you form a planet, you would firstly expect, right, if you're forming if you're forming your planet as you're forming your core, one very easy way to view this is to say, well, the core is a giant ball of iron, and then you've got the silicate a portion that might have some iron oxide on it, and that basically means that iron and iron oxide are sitting somewhere in equilibrium with each other, so you're basically right on this line, depending upon the temperature. And so that you're in very reducing conditions, and this means that gases like methane are stable, uh, H2 is stable, and not things like carbon dioxide. So this has implications for the atmosphere, because you would expect a totally different complement of gases coming out of volcanic systems at these low oxid at these low at these reducing conditions compared to ones in the oxidizing conditions. So up here you're going to get uh, things like carbon dioxide. Down here you're going to get like methane and stuff coming out. So that um, is it true we didn't have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere until, or in the ocean, until we got cyanobacteria about a billion years after the Earth? Uh, so this is, this is true, but only for molecular oxygen. So that is for O2 as the molecule. So O2 is a really powerful oxidizing molecule, and it's what we breathe. That's what we call oxygen. But water, right, is hydrogen and oxygen. So the oceans have always had a giant complement of oxygen, but in a chemically different form. And so it's really the chemical form in and above the elemental composition that is really important. O2, very oxidizing. Uh, we need it to breathe for our processes, chemically highly reactive. Water, uh, very different uh, beast. So uh, in the... Uh, the way that we're going to, to look at this, or the way that uh, Dustin Trail looked at this in 2012, is he said, well, so I want you to take a look at these lines here, right? Ruthenium, ruthenium dioxide, nickel, nickel oxide, molybdenum, molybdenum oxide. So basically he said, I'm going to do some experiments along this curve, this curve, and this curve. And the way that you would control this is that you would simply take in your experimental charge, you would simply put in, if you wanted to do molybdenum, molybdenum, uh, oxide, you would just put in molybdenum and molybdenum oxide and then they would equilibrate in very large quantities relative to the material you want to study. And so they would basically consume oxygen, uh, basically allow the amount of oxygen in the sample to be present at a well-known uh, quantity. So that's why they were called buffers. So he basically did experiments in very reducing conditions, right, where iron is stable, slightly oxidizing, sort of where we're looking at uh, present-day uh, terrestrial magmas, and then something way crazy on the high end. And what he found is that if you look at the rare earth cerium, cerium likes to be in either the plus three state, so it likes to, in chemistry, have three electrons removed or four electrons removed, the plus four state. And this is basically a proxy for that ratio. So under very oxidizing conditions, you would expect more plus four cerium under reducing conditions where iron you know, would be stable, very little four plus cerium. It's all going to want to be three plus. So this is how we're going to trace it because zircon's taken some amount of cerium. So we can use the cerium abundance to understand what the re redox uh, state was like. And so here are our buffers, right? So this is kind of, kind of working. Uh, Molybdenum, uh, molybdenum, molybdenum oxide, again, these very reducing conditions where iron would be stable as a metal. You're finding uh, basically very little cerium in the 4 plus state, 
at nickel nickel oxide more, and at the really crazy uh, oxidizing conditions, you're finding even more, even at the same temperature. So that's great. Uh, you can do this. So uh, here again, this is how much cerium uh, there is in the four plus state. So basically, how oxidizing it is. Here are these lines drawn in. So iron mustide again. This is where iron and iron oxide are stable and coexisting uh, with each other. And so here are some lunar zircons. The moon, again, is great for this. We roughly know that it is sitting at about iron-iron oxide stability. It's got a small metallic core, so it's pretty simple. So when he did this work, he analyzed the zircons, and boom, they plot right where you'd expect them to plot. We can get the temperature on this plot again from the titanium concentration. So you go and you measure uh, what's the titanium concentration, how much, what's the cerium like, and then you say, look, the moon plots beautifully upon wherever you would think iron and iron oxide would be in equilibrium. So very reducing conditions. This is, you know, if you had a volcano, you'd be making methane, you wouldn't be making CO2. And then uh, you can look at the zircons from the Western Australia, from the Jack Hills, and basically perform the same measurement. And okay, so there's a flyer who's a little bit low, but by and large, you can see that this data set is above where the moon is, and is very much so in the range of where you would expect uh, terrestrial uh, magmas, present day magmas, to exist. So this would be telling you that you're expecting something like uh, CO2 rather than methane. So uh, here's the uh, here's the data plotted again versus age. So 4.3 billion years ago. This is basically the uh, oldest sort of samples that he did. And what you're finding is that within you know 150 million years of the planet forming, there are magmas here that are degassing and contributing to the atmosphere that are happening in a crustal setting that from a redox state, from an oxidation state, they look very much like present day uh, crustal magmas uh, to us. So you would be expecting a composition that is very much uh, enriched in say CO2, <coughs> water instead of methane or hydrogen gas coming out. So uh, the other part of this is that the range is still somewhat uh, unsatisfying that this is not a really precise estimate because even much smaller uh, changes, if we were to zoom in, are actually really important. So again, so the volcanic degassing early on, you're looking at water, CO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen, rather than things like ammonia, carbon monoxide, hydrogen uh, sulfide, uh, hydrogen and methane, right? Really toxic, unpleasant gases down here. Are much more habitable, much more friendly, right? Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning is the one that they warn you about coming out of car exhausts and boats and such. So this is not stuff that you want to breathe. Uh, and, but the models that I'm showing you here are sort of theoretical calculations just to show uh, basically what happens in, even if you vary slightly within this field. So we have one case that is a little bit more oxidizing and one that is a little bit more reducing. And you can see basically everything here, water, this is the molar fraction, this is the composition of the gas, how many molecules uh, have each of these compositions. And what you can see is water is pretty similar. You make a lot more uh, hydrogen sulfide at slightly reducing conditions than you do at oxidizing conditions by about a factor of five or something. Uh, you make a lot less uh, sulfur dioxide. So there are, and basically you even have a lot more uh, H2 gas that's slightly reducing versus the oxidizing conditions. So this isn't a super precise estimate yet because we, uh, from the zircon data, right, as I showed you here, we're still, you know, the error bars here are overlapping that entire range. So we'd like to be able to get to get further, but I think this is a remarkable first stab at trying to nail down these conditions early on, and very different from uh, what was expected. Right after, core, after forming a core, you would oftentimes the very simple models that you would, this most simplistic models that you would set up, would predict that your all of your data would be down here, like on the lunar samples. You have a giant ball of iron at the center, and you have some iron oxide uh, in the. Uh, in the mantle, and so you have, uh, you would expect something at about iron was tight, but you, uh, you would not have expected uh, this result. So it actually has been a little bit controversial 
There are numerous people who argue that these are uh, measurement artifacts or other things. I think they are, it's very difficult to actually make these measurements and do these experiments and make this calibration. Uh, these experiments, other groups have tried and come up with, I think, slightly different results, but they didn't, uh, I don't think that work was done nearly as well as this was. So I think this is probably correct. It, uh, uh, it is a very tricky measurement to make. These zircons, if they're uh, a little bit disturbed, this can also me uh, mess with this, your ability to recover this. But, uh, so I will add the caveat for everyone that this is not necessarily universally uh, accepted. This is uh, on the more, some of the more contentious ends, and there will be a lot more work uh, coming in along these lines that uh, will hopefully try and narrow this down and make this to be a more precise uh, estimate. So the, uh, the other thing is that this has pretty big implications for the origin of life experiments. So next time around, we're going to, next uh, in the next sort of lecture running, uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, what we know about the origin of life and such, but the caveat, the link that this has to the next lecture, and the sort of bigger picture view is, uh, for example, the Miller-Urey experiments, when they were done, uh, they were trying to figure out how you make amino acids, which are the key biologic materials, but they had to pick an atmospheric composition. So what they did is they had a flask, and uh, they filled it with gas, and then they put lightning through it as an energy source, and they looked at what kind of molecules they made in this process. But unfortunately for them, their composition was very reducing. So they used a lot of methane in their experiments, and probably something that isn't uh, close to the early Earth that we looked at. So while these experiments are really uh, interesting and tell us that you can go from a gas with lightning to these complex molecules, uh, they are probably at the wrong uh, at the wrong atmospheric composition, and that ultimately, in order to try and under, try to understand this conditions under which the life, this, these are important differences between whether or not you have methane available or carbon dioxide. They make uh, differences, quite big differences in in the chemistry. So you ultimately, for trying to understand these processes, such as where did life come from, I would argue you really need to know these compositions so that people can make great analog experiments because no one's going to come along with a time capsule and let us go back and watch it uh, first grow. So we've got to narrow down what that parameter space is to likely values on when it happened on the early Earth. So uh, basically, in summary for today, uh, the, uh, the early Earth uh, paradigm of you know, it being dry and hot, uh, I think there's numerous lines of evidence that are strongly against this. Uh, I showed, I've shown you from everything from the titanium content in the zircon to the inclusion assemblage to the oxygen isotope composition that there is, a, uh, that there is evidence for water and that you need water to explain what the zircons look like geochemically that if you were to do this on a dry place like the moon, you end up with very different looking zircons. They form at much hotter temperatures. They don't have the oxygen isotope effects that we see. And so they don't have the inclusion assemblage that we see either. You don't have muscovite in a lunar zircon. And so that this is a really nice direct test because the lunar zircons are about the same age range, 4 to 4.4 billion years old. They form at very similar times, but geochemically look totally different than the zircons we find on the Earth. The ones on the Earth formed at relatively low temperatures, they formed at uh, conditions where you had surface interactions of water and rock, and that they formed under much more oxidizing conditions where you, you know, were releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere rather than, say, methane and H2. So what I want to talk about next time is uh, when did life start on Earth, and do we actually know the answer to that, uh, to that question, and what's the evidence like? Because again, we're going to have to look at zircons because there's not a four and a half billion year old organism we can just ask. The earliest uh, life is certainly dead and it's evolved since then. So we're going to have to look at again at its effects on the rock record. And uh, what we're ultimately going to what I'm going to show you is that uh, I think we have carbon that is basically 4.1 billion years old, or we had it until we analyzed it. And that this will again be an isotopic argument about life and what uh, the effects of isotopes are on carbon isotopes, effects of life is on carbon isotopes, 
and that will be coming uh, next week and how, you know, where we are on, you know, do we know, can we ever know, uh, sort of uh, speculations. So thank you and I'll take any questions. simply because their atmospheric composition is very reducing and over what we observe for the early Earth. a lot. Uh, 
And where the, so the carbon uh, in the, uh, that is coming from in the volcanoes, this is a really excellent question, and this is really hard to pin down. So a lot of carbon has been processed biologically on this planet. It's been locked up, right? Our oil is coming from dead critters from 500 million years ago. And so some of it is certainly coming from that, right? That's the anthropogenic global warming. We're now burning that, putting it back in the atmosphere. Where it's coming from in volcanoes is a harder question because you have some organic sediments going down, but also the mantle has some carbon in it. So this is one of these questions is where is that carbon now coming from? That carbon, uh, is it being lost from the mantle? Is it coming mostly from the sediments? And so these are places where people make some isotopic arguments. We'll get into carbon isotopes next lecture in terms of biology. But this is the carbon cycle, especially through time, as to where the carbon is being partitioned and where the CO2 that is now being released is coming from, uh, is heavily debated. Early on, uh, I would say this was either in the form of some carbon-bearing sediments, if, if this was delivered by meteorites, or this is straight out gassing from the mantle, so that you are looking at uh, the mantle maybe losing some carbon over time. So we don't actually, so it depends upon how the Earth got its carbon to start with. If it got it in the form of carbonaceous chondrites delivered to the surface layer that were then weathered, they would be incorporated, right? they would be, you know, carbonaceous chondrites are hitting, they're sitting on the surface, they would weather, and then they're, they would get incorporated uh, into the cycle that way from the top down. On the other hand, maybe the Earth uh, formed with quite a bit of carbon that was being that was being outgassed, and so the, it's actually you're losing it from the mantle. So I don't quite know where it's coming from. We need a lot more information about the Hadean carbon cycle. I'll show you next lecture. Uh, we have two data points. Oh, so it's lack of hydrogen that really suppresses the methane. Yep. So we probably lost a lot of hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Does the rock record give any idea of the percentage of water that may have been present very early? Uh, that is a hard question and one that uh, you can find estimates from everything from uh, the surfaces had less water to the surfaces had more water. So this is people trying to understand this in terms of this process of can you efficiently subduct water from the surface or can this process basically hydrate the mantle and uh, there's, there's, no clear, there's no clear consensus on that issue. So yes, no, maybe. Okay, well, my, my problem with that, of course, is that Estimates of the surface temperature in pre-Hadian times, if you will, it is conjectural at this point, right? Or do you have good hard evidence? Uh, there is no good hard evidence for surface temperatures, except you need to be somewhere in a regime where water is still at the surface. Mm -hmm. Yes? I talked to different scientists that studied where the water may have come from, and I said, well, what about comments? Because Comets could be up to 50% water, and carbonates of chondrites, meteorites could be up to 11%. And they said no, because the isotopic composition is different. But I think even you mentioned it, but maybe back then, comets coming in from a different part of space could have a different composition. Uh, comets, so the argument there for comets is that there is the deuterium to hydrogen ratio and that this is very different for comets uh, than it is for the Earth. And so people occasionally find one that's close and so within the error bars you can switch and say it was that comet or that family of comets. There is of course the other issue that you sort of uh, hinted at that uh, the comets, if the comets gave us water, the comets that gave us the water are now present in the Earth and not in space anymore so we need to Actually, in order to study those components, we need to have some hard survive and actually be uh, uh, in a way that we can analyze what its isotopic composition is. So for D to H, you can do, you can do that easily from, uh, from space using remote sensing, using telescopes. Other isotopic systems are harder. Carbonaceous chondrites fall all over the map isotopically. They have a huge diversity. The Earth did not accrete with a lot of carbonaceous chondrite. On the other hand, you don't need a lot of carbonaceous chondrites because they are so water rich. So you might be able to hide a little bit of it. There are arguments against this isotopically speaking, but maybe you can work your way in, in that direction. Um, and maybe you, some of the other elements are then affected by other isotopic things. So there's, there's a whole bunch of possible answers that you can come up with, and basically you can mix it and try to hide it, and these are uh, games that people play in the literature. But, so this is far from, an open, far, from, far from a solved question. It's really open. There's good evidence against carbonaceous chondrites at the present moment, though. Other questions? In the back?
Um, are we at some point going to uh, uh, cover the uh, implications of the Martian Rock ALH double, uh, A4001? And, uh, uh, the possibility that there is a very small micro fossil in there. Uh, that, this was really hyped up, and that was really shoddy work that should have never been hyped up in the first place. So the, uh, the uh, evidence for life in ALH 84001 uh, is really overblown. It was something, basically, people looked at it with an electron microscope and said, hey, this looks kind of like it could be a, mac it, it could be a bacteria, and then they got a press conference. Uh, this, is, this, is far from, this is far from convincing. It, it, other people have analyzed it. Uh, since then, the, those original argue, uh, those original uh, things. There's other ways to make things that sort of look like that in in the rocks. It would be its own dedicated lecture. I might I might throw something in for next time. But the uh, it was yeah shoddy work that was overblown in the first place. Well, um, is it possible that uh, something could come off Mars possibly an asteroid strike? Maybe there was life there very early on there. And that came to the earth as and still alive. Uh, that, and maybe it formed from there. That is really, really that I means that's possible. I have nothing I have nothing that I can tell you that life formed on Earth that didn't come here from elsewhere. On the other hand, it just makes the problem harder because now you've got to form it somewhere else, transport it through space onto Earth and, and get it here. Uh, so we certainly have rocks from Mars. Uh, that's indisputable. We have a lot of Martian meteorites in our collection. We've learned a lot about Mars from them. We have no evidence in them of life in them. But it is it, this, the idea is called panspermia, that you can move life from one planet to another by impact. It is possible to eject rocks off the surface of planets without heating them a lot. Basically, when you do simulations of what comes off, you can, especially from small bodies, <laughs> stuff that didn't get super hot, so there is a possibility of life surviving. But uh, we have no evidence that this has taken place. Um. I understood that uh, what was called the Murchison meteorite that hit Australia may have also had something much more life-like in it than other uh, samples. You, you, can, you can find in meteorites, especially in carbonaceous comedorites, you can find really nice complex organic molecules, but they are not, uh, they are not made through, they're not made by life. They're made through another process. And the way that this is, uh, one of the ways that, uh, you can, uh, you can look at this is that there is something called chirality that molecules have. So molecules have a certain structure to them, and they have, uh, basically, you can draw some of those structures and make them symmetric. Think left-handed and right-handed. Life heavily selects for one chi chirality on Earth, and the ones that we find in meteorites have them 50-50. So they were probably made in a much more random process and not something, at least, that we are, at least how we would understand life. We also don't find critters in them, or other things. We just find uh, organic molecules, and there are ways to make those in gas reactions, especially in the radiation of ice over long periods of time, or these materials over long periods of time. Uh, you can also interpret some of these things as propaganda for the astronomical industrial complex. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I would say if we, you know, said that there was oil on Mars. <laughs> I think Halliburton would have been there years ago. <laughs> I, I'm all for this, right? If we find, you know, if we can claim oil on Mars, we'd have a great space program going. <laughs> I, I would know. I, I asked the same question to Stephen J. Gold years ago when he was still living, and he, he agreed with you completely. He just did, was not impressed with the evidence of fossil life forms in Martian rocks from yeah. space. But, uh, clarifying again, it looks like very early on there would have been a steam atmosphere that cooled and condensed, rains for what, a couple million years, forms the oceans, and then we begin? Uh, that's one very plausible way of doing so we, it. We don't know for we, sure. We don't quite know for sure, but the steam atmosphere is very, very plausible. Uh, steam atmospheres are really interesting things too. Uh, they have huge effects on planets cooling and such. Uh, but we don't quite know. So that is one possible opinion. Another one is that we never had it, and that the water is basically slowly sort of uh, coming out in rock forming processes such as sort of the magma. Okay, sort of rising to the surface from the mantle itself. Well, coming out. So water is incompatible. It wants to come out of rocks. It doesn't like necessarily being in rocks. It wants to go into the melt. So if you start to melt, 
rocks even a little bit, you would, they would, uh, the water would come, the water would go into the melt rather than stay in the solid rock. Uh, in a sort of very simplified way of looking at it. Like the combination of a factors, outgassing the water vapor, which would condense in rain, but also water seeping to the surface. Uh, yeah, it all, it, there's, there's a lot more questions here. This is, you know, for the field, in terms of actually looking at this, this is really early days. The oldest sort of reference that I've been citing here for the direct geologic evidence, the oxygen isotopes, it's 1999. So you're looking at something that was done in basically 18. We've had, we've known about them since the zircon since the 80s. Their analytical techniques, you know, take a while, people take a while to catch up and decide, hey, these are really interesting samples. So we really started looking at them in the 2000s. So this is a lot of this work, right? The dust and trails work on the redox conditions for the atmosphere implication. It was done in 2012, and that was really the first actual data point that we got. So we're talking about uh, very early days here. Right, we're talking about samples from one location on the planet, right? These are still from the Jack Hills in Western Australia. This is still the same, same old pile of zircons that I've been talking about because that's the only place on the planet we've got more than one from. The other ones, you find one. So this is, uh, this is incredibly early days, and this is some of the really the first looks we're getting at this time period from the geologic record and not from the sort of, well, what do we think happened uh, perspective. So, other questions? So the zircons you talked about the, the, are on moon rock as well? Uh, we have zircons from the moon, yes. So they were found in the Apollo mission. So we take the Apollo missions brought back, I want to say it's 500 kilograms of rock or something, they brought back or 300, they brought back quite a bit of rock. And people crush, people crush these up and look for zircons in them. And so the great thing there is that we can use this as an analog to the early Earth is that we can do this comparison because we know the moon clearly so doesn't have liquid water on it. So the moon and the Earth formed about the same time, that's how you know that. Uh, the, the moon and the Earth formed at about the same time. The moon probably formed when a giant thing ran into the Earth and threw off debris, and this probably happened sort of 50 million years after. So 4.51 billion years ago is when the moon formed right around. That. So you can spot that in the zircon? You can do that in the zircons. If you look at the, uh, I showed you the hafnium isotopes that show the cross mantle. You can play the same game on the moon. and. The moon's got to be about 4.5, uh, 1 billion years old. So you can do this on the Earth. You can form it. You look at you can form it a very early crust on the moon. Uh, you can do the same thing and say we're going to look at how lutetium and hafnium behave in the magmas. They're going to behave differently after I form a crust. The lutetium wants to stay in the mantle. The hafnium is going to go into the crust. Uh, so the lutetium hafnium ratio is lower. So you look at the hafnium isotopes and say based on the known half life of lutetium, when did the moon form? This is recent. Relatively recent result. Uh, the first time that was done was 2009, and then the second one was published this year, uh, earlier this year, or late, was it late last year. Uh, I should know. <laughs> so anyway, 2016, 2017, relatively recent work. What is the distribution of carbonates in the early rocks? That is an excellent question, and we don't know. We'll, we'll get into the early carbon cycle past uh, and. Yeah, I have, I have, I'm not even willing to speculate. Thank you. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.